Uh, but before we get started, will you join me? Let's pray together. Father, we welcome you to our time here together. We ask that you would bless and anoint our time as we meet and as we share uh, our lives together, but as we also hear a word from you to um, open up our hearts to maybe new things you want to show us this morning. So uh, we ask for your blessings on this time, and uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, okay, I uh, do want to go over a brief announcement, uh, which has to do with our upcoming schedule. Um, these are the remaining dates where we don't have SASF uh, available to us. And as you can see, we do have another one coming up in a couple of weeks on June 5th, when we've now reserved and will be holding our service on Strauss Island, which is located uh, within Elk Grove Regional Park. Uh, Elk Grove Regional Park is located between Elk Grove Boulevard to the north and Cameroon to the south, if you can see that map, just on the east side of 99 Freeway. Uh, you can see, if you can read that, it says right there that it has lakes. Or, I'm sorry, it has islands. And uh, it's on one of those islands that we will be holding our service. Um, here's a map of the park itself. Uh, I circled Strauss Island in red, and you can either get there through gate one um, on the bottom, which is off of Outgrove Florin Boulevard, or you can get there from gate two, which is up on the frontage road, just parallel across from the freeway. Uh, there is, oh, to go to the next one, um, this is a picture of Strauss Island. Um, there's a small little moat that's in front of me that I guess qualifies it as an island with some disgusting water in it. And then there is an open cement area uh, where they're gonna have seats. They said as many as up to 100 seats. Um, and then a stage area, which is behind that little hedge. Um, so we'll start our services at 10 o'clock. And since uh, we didn't reserve any picnic tables, or, uh, we still are going to hand out food uh, after the service, that, but maybe we can just briefly chat while we eat or maybe take our food to go. Okay, so that's going to be June 6th. We'll be holding our service on Strauss Island at Elk Grove Regional Park. Okay, so that's... Oh, actually, I do have one more announcement. Um, I was told that Brendan Wong successfully got your Eagle Scout. So we do want to recognize that. Awesome. That's awesome. I think we have another Eagle Scout up here as well. I think Doug has his Eagle Scout, correct? Yeah. Um, anyways, congratulations. Um, I'm going to go ahead and transition into my message uh, for this morning. Um, We've been following the church lectionary for most of this year, which is really, it's new for me. Um, but I've actually been enjoying the process. Um, the lectionary is a set of selected scripture passages from different parts of the Bible that are pre-selected for each week in a three-year cycle. And I've been using the gospel readings for each week, and I'm going to do so again. This week is a little bit different in that there are actually two gospel readings that both come from the Gospel of John. Uh, one comes from the fifth chapter, and the other one comes from the 14th chapter. Uh, I'm going to go with the passage from the fifth chapter, which takes us back to an earlier period in Jesus's ministry. Now, I say earlier because it occurs earlier, or pretty early in the Gospel of John, but when exactly this event occurred within Jesus' three-year ministry is hard to tell since the gospel writers weren't necessarily recording things chronologically as we might tend to assume when we read through any of the gospels. Jesus is in Jerusalem for one of the three large festivals for which devout Jews would make a pilgrimage to the capital city. And since the early stages of Jesus' ministry actually began in the region of Galilee, 
Many scholars believe that this event in the fifth chapter of John, although it's occurring very early in his gospel, could have happened in the second half of Jesus' three-year ministry, given what many believe to be the general timeline of his movements. The scripture reading for today is relatively short, uh, just nine verses, starting with verse, uh, the first verse of chapter five. So let's just go ahead and dive right into it. Here's what it reads. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. After reading this scripture passage and doing some research and collecting my thoughts on it for some time, I was a little bit dismayed when I discovered that I'd actually spoken on this passage twice in the last several years. I, I knew about the time when I spoke about it when we did the series on the questions of Jesus, but I found out that I actually spoke about or used this passage of scripture less than a year ago which initially made me want to stop and pick out a different passage to speak on, but I felt like, man, I'm too far invested in this one. And although there are some things that might sound vaguely familiar to you, there are different things that came to my mind as I wrestled with this passage of Scripture this time around. As the passage indicates, and as I mentioned earlier, Jesus is in Jerusalem for one of the three major festivals. And so the population of Jerusalem at that time would have swelled as many make a pilgr pilgrimage to the capital city to attend the festival. And so there would have been this feeling of excitement, this energy that's in the air. And one of the striking things about this scripture passage is the simple fact that at the time of such a festive occasion, when Jesus' popularity was likely on the rise, he chooses to spend time at this pool where many of the lame and the blind and the paralyzed would gather because there was some kind of legend that the waters of this pool had certain healing properties. Now this location has actually been excavated and identified and believed to have been fed by these underground springs that would well up from time to time and would create these bubbles that would rise to the surface. And so those in ancient times attributed those bubbles to an angel stirring the water. And if you could be the first one to get into the waters after it was stirred, you'd be healed of whatever it is that ailed you which, as you may guess, brought all sorts of sick, broken, disabled people to the edge of its waters because hope is such a powerful thing. And so all around the edges of this pool, surrounded by these five colonnades, you'll find the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and people suffering from other chronic forms of infirmities. And in a world where physical ailments and sin were often conflated such that people felt that your disability was the result of some sin that you are now obviously being punished for and physical ailments were also conflated with diseases so that people felt compelled to keep a safe distance from you to stay away from you because they didn't want to catch whatever it is that you had in that world these people were the ostracized. They were labeled the sinful. 
They were the object lessons that people pointed at and avoided. They were the discarded and forgotten people of society tossed off to the margins of life. And it's not all that different today. It's interesting that the English translation of many of our Bibles uses the word invalid to describe this paralyzed man and many of the other individuals around the pool on that day. This word has come to be associated with those who are physically disabled, either through birth or maybe through injury. And although many of us don't fit into the category of people that this English word conveys, the Latin word upon which our English word invalid is based can be broken down into in for not and validus for strong. Therefore, the Latin word invalidus means not strong. And might I suggest to you that Jesus both then and now notices the not strong ones. In fact, he pays particular attention throughout his life and ministry to those who are not strong. And there are many ways in which we are not strong. Some not strongness, like for the man in this Bible, is obvious. People who are literally physically sick, weak, and disabled. Other not strongness, however, is not always obvious. Like those who are maybe mourning the loss of a loved one and who wonder if the grief is going to crush them. Or those who are bearing the weight of their financial burdens and who can't seem to just get their head above water, they're treading water no matter how hard they try. Or those who suffer from depression and anxiety. Those who are desperately lonely for human contact. Those who are caring for the needs of a loved one whose needs are often more than you feel that you can bear. Those whose faith is withering on the vine. Who can't seem to believe in the ways that they once did. Who struggle to pray and, and maybe seem to not find any relevance to worship. Those who feel that they're not good enough or smart enough or pretty enough or creative enough to make a difference, to be validated. You see, that's a play on the English word invalid. Because as, as an adjective, it could also mean invalid, as in not valid, not true, faulty, inadequate. And how many of us here have felt invalidated, unworthy, not valid? You see, here's the thing. In a time when the city of Jerusalem is rocking with festivities and excitement, Jesus comes looking for the invalidated, for the invalids, for the not strong people that are suffering on the margins which says a lot about the character of our God. And all of these not strong, suffering, struggling people are there resting their hopes on an illusion, feeding the false idea that we, in the end, are nothing more than our circumstances. If I could just be healed of this infirmity, then I would truly find life. You see, if we're honest, most of us know what that's like. Because we've all, at one time or another, fallen victim to that way of thinking. It's the as soon as life. We say to ourselves, or maybe even out loud to other people, you know, as soon as this happens or that happens, everything's going to be better. I'll be happy, my problems will go away, I'll be satisfied, all will be well. Children often say, you know, as soon as I get big and grow up, when I'm an adult, have more freedom, then I'm going to be happy. <laughs> Those of us who are older, we know it doesn't end there. 
Because then it becomes, well, as soon as I graduate, or get a job, or get a better job, as soon as I get married or I find that relationship in my life, as soon as I have more time or more money or a better house, as soon as he changes the way that he acts around me or she apologizes to me, as soon as I lose 10 pounds or have that procedure done, as soon as I can just get over this grief, this period, just make it through this stretch of time, I mean, as soon as you can fill in the blank with just about anything. The problem is, once you make it to the pool of Bethesda, there'll always be another one after that. And another one after that. And it can get to a point that your life just gets put on hold. We wind up sitting on our mat self-imprisoned by the circumstances of our lives. Jesus comes to this pool, this place with people suffering from all sorts of infirmities that no self-respecting rabbi would ever come close to for fear of contamination or association. And it says that he sees this man and he knows that he's been there a long time. You see, Jesus sees this man, all of this man. He knows his story. He knows all that this man has endured, all the ways in which his condition has alienated and ostracized him. He knows the stigma associated and attached to disease in the ancient world. He knows that lame is often interchangeable with unclean or sinner. He knows how this man has suffered physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually. He knows the ways in which his condition now has just burrowed so deeply down into his psyche and his soul that it has perhaps become the very defining feature of his existence. As John's Gospel underscores again and again and again, when Jesus sees and knows us, he sees and he knows us through and through, more widely and more deeply than we know ourselves. He looks deep into us with eyes that see the whole truth of who we are and that perceives everything in us and everything about us. Wherever Jesus goes, he sees people in pain and in need, and he knows the story behind the story. In fact, he knows the story behind every story. He knows all of our afflictions, all of the things that hurt and frighten us. He knows the ways in which we've been victimized, the ways in which our suffering is often or sometimes not our fault. He knows the ways in which we're sometimes the instruments of our own misfortune. He knows all the things that we've done and all the things that we have left undone. Jesus knows all the things about this man that we can possibly know of and even more. But he doesn't ask this man about any of this. He doesn't ask to hear this man's story. He doesn't speak condescendingly to him. He doesn't pity him. He doesn't rail against the societal influences and structures that keep men like him forced out onto the edges of society. He asks one simple question. Do you want to get well? Or a more accurate translation would be, do you want to become whole? Now on the surface, it's really a surprising question because given this man's condition and the circumstances of his life, waiting at this poolside here for a long, long time, it would seem obvious. So why waste time? Why bother to even ask this question? Because when someone's hungry, what do you do? You feed them. When someone's thirsty, you give them something to drink. It's a question that unsettles, and maybe even if we're honest, is a little bit offensive. How can you ask such a thing, Jesus? I mean, 38 years by the pool, 
all the years of grief, all the pain of suffering through this illness, all the shame that he's had to endure, of course he wants to be well. But Jesus asks the question anyway. Because he knows that behind what we say about our suffering are often other stories that are at work. I like how Debbie Thomas uh, puts it in her weekly blog when she writes, For me, the question stings because I know exactly what it's like to say I want out, to say I want freedom, to say I want healing and not quite mean it. I know what it's like to cling to brokenness because it's familiar. I know what it's like to make victimhood my identity. I know what it's like to benefit from the very things that cause me harm. I know what it's like to sink into self-pity. I know what it's like to assume that everyone else has access to a magic pill I'll never get my hands on. I know what it's like to decide that I'm doomed to sit at the very edge of healing for the rest of my life and never attain it. For me, the question stings because the very idea that God cares about what I want, that he's curious about my desires, that he wants me to recognize and articulate them, blows me away. Jesus' question reveals something really important about God. The God that we meet and that is revealed in Jesus is one who doesn't force or push, even when it comes to offering healing. The God we see in Jesus is deeply respectful of our freedom and gives us space to choose. And so it seems that in order for real healing to take place, God's desire to heal us must work in tandem with our own desire to be made well. Do you want to be made well? It's not just a rhetorical question on Jesus' part. Because like Debbie Thomas said, sometimes what we say and what we really want are actually two very different and almost contradictory things. Do I really want to be made well? Well, yeah. Sometimes, no. I mean, a part of me does at times gravitate towards playing the victim card because I get to abdicate responsibility for my own well-being by blaming other people for wounding me or offending me or for keeping holding me back or keeping me stuck in whatever cycle of unhealthy behavior that I just can't seem to free myself from. I mean, even when it comes to, say, bringing wholeness, not just to uh, myself, but even to, say, the world around me, and the people in this world, I tend to have limits. Do I want the environment to become more healthy and whole? Well, again, yeah. But then there is a part of me that prefers to avert my eyes, to look away from certain things and focus on more things that are manageable things that make me come up with lame solutions like, okay, well, I'll change the lighting in my house to be more efficient light bulbs and be more cognizant of my recycling habits. I mean, what else can I do? I'm too small to make any real difference. Surely someone or something else is going to come along that's going to bring about this real and lasting change. It can't depend on me. Do I want wellness and wholeness for not just the people in my life, but the people around this world? Well, yeah. But I still want to buy the clothes that I want without having to worry about where they're made and the working conditions in those factories. And when it comes to my own wellness, well, yeah, I want to be healed, I want to be whole, I want to be made well, but I don't really want to reconcile with that person. And I don't really want to deal with that dysfunctional aspect of my marriage or spend time trying to resolve my sometimes uncontrollable anger. I mean, when you say, do you want to be well, what exactly do you mean, Jesus? How far are we supposed to take this? It's a good question, after all. 
a question that requires honest self-examination, one that requires us to get a shovel and a pick and to start carrying out some archaeology of our soul and to dig down deep beneath the bedrock of our hardened exterior to what we really, really want deep down. And if, I, if, if we do that, and if we make it far enough, I think we will find that deep down, we want to be fully alive. We want to love and be loved and draw close to the source of that love. Deep down, we want our lives to be something larger than ourselves and our endless striving for self-promotion. We want our lives to be full of light and to be a blessing to other people. And if that's the case, I believe Jesus would say to us, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. But wait, uh, don't I need to wait for the water when the time is right and it's stirred so I can get down there and get in the water? No. All you want, all that you need, all that you truly desire in life is not found out there. Stop looking to the Bethesda pools of this world. All that your heart longs for is here. You already have it. If you'll just open up your heart to the grace and the love and the ways of God that I am offering you, you will find the life that you're looking for. Doesn't mean that your life is going to get easier. Doesn't mean your circumstances are going to change. They may not. In fact, I like what one writer said when he wrote that sometimes what it means to be made well is simply to be given the strength to suffer well. Think about that. The Bible says in Hebrews 2.10 that Jesus was made perfect through suffering, where the underlying word translated as perfect stands more for completeness, for wholeness. Sometimes what it means to be made well is, is maybe to come to this understanding of the deep mystery and truth of our Christian faith that Paul spoke of in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he wrote, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Jesus looks for those who are not strong, those who are invalids, those who are invalidated, but who are wanting to get well. Somehow in all of this, our wanting is important, for without the desire for wellness, we won't take any steps whether it's towards our own actual healing or towards lightening the burden of another individual or towards learning how to suffer well. No matter what our context, no matter what our affliction, no matter what narrative we might have chosen to make sense of our suffering, Jesus stubbornly insists on our freedom to take a step toward wholeness, to make a choice and to say what it is that we want. Do you want to be made well? This is a choice that we have the freedom to make every day of our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, as I wrestle with this question, I realize that I'm so conflicted. I realize how often in my life I say one thing, but I don't actually mean it. Do we want to get well? It is a question that goes down into the depths of our soul, because if we do, I think there are things we know that we have to address.
I think like this man, there are so many people who are waiting on the edges of a pool, waiting for the waters to be stirred, hoping to find whatever it is that's going to bring the healing that comes from outside of them. And that never works, Lord, not long term. The healing, the getting well comes from within. And the only way to get there is to answer that question in the ways that we talked about. So help us to do that. Because I think in some large part that is the essence of our faith in many ways. Is learning to allow your spirit more and more to transform us. But we always have a part in it. A role to play. You always give us choice and freedom. So we thank you, Lord, for our time. Uh, we pray that you would bless our time of, of communion and prayer now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.